All right, cool, folks. So um, we're briefly going to be talking about a capability statement. And what a capability statement is, is basically your cover letter to government agencies. Uh, and in today's world, it is much more complicated because before even the person who will commission the evaluation or will even look at a contract and is the deciding factor, uh, usually their legal department or compliance will take a look at your capability statement first to determine, A, if you're legitimate, if you're an actual business, uh, if you have a profile, they will look at your commodity codes, and I'll discuss that, what those are, and to see if you are a possible match to even then go further down the chain and to be considered for a contract or proposal or response or anything. So capability statements are used both by city, state, federal agencies, and by other nonprofits, foundations, um, uh, and places like GuideStar, uh, candid, uh, the foundation center to look at you, to see what you can do. What have you done in the past? What sets you apart from other people in the same boat? Uh, and to really kind of gauge and take your temperature to see if you're going to be a good fit for that organization. So, um, the key word, it's basically a cover letter for your, to begin to get to know each other, um, before you even begin to have a sit down to negotiate proposals or anything of that nature. Uh, Do you wanna, oh, there you go. Awesome. Yep. Uh, so I'm gonna minimize you folks, but as a New Yorker, I encourage anyone to interrupt me uh, because that's what we do, right? What is a capability statement? So it's usually a one to a two page document explaining what services your organization can perform Consider it to be a cover lever, brief, but tailored to the organization you want to work with. Often the document will be screened by artificial intelligence and compliance. So you want to keep it simple fonts, black and white, not heavy on graphics, but yes, keyword heavy, appropriate language for the industry you're going and relevant codes. And you should consult with um, the agency in terms of those codes. So this is, and I'll drop this in the chat, is really what my, the New York City Small Business um, Association, and, and in particular, the PTAC group, which is the, uh, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, uh, they recommend you follow something along the lines of this format uh, to have these key components. And we're gonna go into each of the key components and what should be included, uh, but to have this format, again, Try to keep it simple. One to two pages does not have to be overly elaborate. So the first part of the capability statement without going, without saying it, uh, has to specify that it is a capability statement. So many agencies, and especially government agencies, have specific guidelines on how to even save this document and what should the, uh, the title of the document be and the format. Almost 95% of the agencies require this document in a PDF format, not in a Word, not in a picture mode, but a PDF. Um, and it's strongly recommended that you, especially for us Mac users, you actually get the official Adobe product, the DC, so it's compatible with the government service, servers and state and local servers, right? So you want to show your logo on top. You want to designate one contact person in your organization that they can go to. So you want that person's name, their phone number, and their email. Uh, preferably a professional-looking email with your, you know, with your domain's name. I recommend not using your real phone number, but using a Google service or something else as a proxy uh, in case these documents do get shared around. Um, Use so the, the first, the, the main core of your uh, capability statement is called the core competencies. And that is really what catches the eye, both from a human and from artificial intelligence. This is where, like the executive summary of a resume or the uh, executive summary of your business plan, you want to quickly tell someone what you do um, in bullet points using appropriate jargon, not too heavy, right? 
and you want to fill in all the margins uh, as much as possible um, and use white space. You could use some graphics. You can use a background. You can get artistic with you if it. But the key point is to remember that this will be read by somebody, so it has to be readable, and it will go through a scanning process with artificial intelligence. Um, I do change them depending on the city agency or the state agency. So like your resume, having a quick one pager that you can quickly adapt, copy and paste things in is really useful for that first section. So the second section, um, and it doesn't have to follow this format, but these are things that agencies and the contracting officer, he, she, they will look at is your past performance. Um, and if you don't have a past performance, which is possible, ways that you can convey to that person that you are indeed qualified and you know how to do the task um, at hand, past projects, et cetera, or something similar that you can talk to pictures and illustrator, right? Your past performance, that is important. The other uh, very important thing as you're in a competition with other folks is your differentiators. Your differentiators are a quick summary of why you are better or different or more appropriate to do the evaluation than some of your other peers and colleagues. And it shouldn't be seen as a, so as a competition, although I did say a competition, but more as to why you are a better fit for that organization. And things you can add there could be your past experience with that agency. It could be that the fact that you're local to that locality in New York, uh, where you're applying. Just for um, references, one of the issues uh, for the folks who do educational evaluation, I don't, but because I've been talking with people who do educational evaluation in New York City, New York City actually outsources uh, the bulk of their educational evaluation programs to firms in Chicago and in Philadelphia and in DC. Why? Because uh, a lot of the folks who do this in New York City do not identify themselves as being educational evaluators. And so um, currently the Department of Education in New York City, the Department for Youth and Community Services are really trying to find evaluators who are local to New York City, not just because of COVID and travel restrictions, but people who understand the community and can go and do outreach and collect data and know the zip codes and the neighborhoods and the communities and things like that, right? So the bottom portion of your capability statement should include, again, some part of your company data. Uh, that could be the size of your company, the scope of work, the geography of it, um, a very brief summary or why you're specialized or, or uh, something that's unique to you, right? And of course, very pertinent, very specified towards uh, the agency you're applying for the contract. Now, here is my least favorite part of the capability statement. It is a lot of the technical jargon, but it is also sort of the most important part of the technical aspect. So. Uh, as Matt said on his call yesterday, everyone you know who, who contracts with the government, who wants to apply for a grant or who's going to administer a grant, even as part of the evaluation component of a grant, should have a DUNS number, okay, which is free. It is free. Um, and there is now a process in the federal government that was supposed to start in 2021 where the federal government will take over issuing an identifier for folks. Because of COVID, that's most likely pushed to 2022. So DUNS is in play for 2021. Cage code is specific towards the military uh, and the DOD, but believe it or not, it is used by other agencies as well. It's a, it's a small code. I will show you on some other um, capability statements how that's identified. The NI, uh, NAICS codes which are uh, the classifiers for our industry. So this is a big one for us in evaluation. I, and I'm open to ideas here. I listed myself as a general consultant and one that does social economic research, um, but there are other NI and 
AICS codes and you can make them relevant to your organization and you can list as many of those but fewer than 15 they suggest so that you're casting a wide enough net where evaluation which is a hard to define field gets or an applied research in particular gets identified as such right social economic certification so 8A be either being a minority, uh, major, minority, majority owned business, a, um, a woman owned business, part of a development zone, et cetera. You should list that. Um, but I would also uh, argue don't start with that when you're making a pitch towards anyone. Um, always start with the fact that you are the best person for uh, the job regardless of the fact that you have these social economic certifications. But those social economic certifications are very useful for um, set aside proposals and money to fund small businesses and to target minority businesses and women owned businesses. And they're also important if you want to subcontract with somebody who has gotten a contract or who traditionally gets this contract over the years, uh, but because of government uh, regulation or the fact that they have moved to other projects, they're looking to subcontract with somebody who's local on the ground, who knows the community uh, and who's an up and coming business. So you want to be able to uh, offer that to them um, in order to get uh, the possibility or that opportunity. Yes, as crazy, as stupid as this sounds for evaluators, being able to accept credit cards is actually an important thing. And you're gonna say, why the hell is that an important thing? Usually we sign contracts and things like this, but often what happens is just before the quarter end of the budget, um, if there's small projects, something like a thousand, two thousand dollars, a small data cleanup or um, assisting an agency with data collection, the people who usually contract out for these are hard pressed for time. Uh, they have a go, they can do it under discretionary spending. They literally have their government credit card or their city of New York issued credit card. And they're gonna say, look, I need you to go to a couple of schools and collect data, or I need you to do this. Um, we can offer you X amount of money, but I need, you know, you can do it next week, but I need to plug it in my system in the next 48 hours because if I don't use this money, I lose it. So you wanna be able to say, yes, let me send you an invoice of what I think this is going to cost and you know, charge it on the credit card, get it off your item line, et cetera. Also, something I'm learning through this process, especially with regards to New York City, it could be different with regards to other localities in New York City. If you are a uh, 8A women minority owned business, your exemption for going uh, outside of the normal RFP proposal process is up to half a million dollars. So it is up to, but it could be less. So it is very much possible that an evaluation contract for $125,000 per se will not go through an RFP and you will, and you will be granted it through a discretionary line item. Uh, on the budget doesn't mean that there's not going to be any audits or that uh, no accountability. It just means the RFP won't happen uh, and you'll get tapped on the shoulder because you're on a short list uh, of evaluators capable to perform something. Um, you want to discuss any team agreements that you have in place and you want to name drop any of your other federal uh, contracts if you have them or grant numbers. Okay, so that's the general overview, and I, I apologize, I can't see everyone, but if you have any questions at this time, you can shoot them. Uh, if not, what I was going to do, I was going to show a couple of capability statements from other evaluators that are available online, and I downloaded from these, these companies' websites just to give you an overview of what other people are doing, and of course, I'm going to share my capability statement, but again, this is a capability statement from Data to Insight. It's based in Seattle, Washington. And you see that although they do not follow the uh, template I laid out, they do have the components in different areas. So you do see up here, for instance, um, and let me, see, I don't know if I can annotate. Oh, I can annotate. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, with my mouse, for instance, but 
so here's the company logo, right? The inside, how it's named and how it's registered. These are the cage codes. So they're not put on the bottom, they're put on the side. You see the Dunn's number, you see their EIN. I am actually a little hesitant to put an EIN uh, for many reasons on a capability statement, but some people do that. Their cage code, their business certifications, right? So they're a woman small owner, a small business, Washington State. Uh, they do have a certification uh, that they are, that they work with le uh, lesbian, gay, bi, transsexual, and in general, people of color. So you see um, uh, that sort of certification. They list their core competencies and they put in a color box. They also discuss their value proposition. They again discuss their differentiators and why they're different. And the point of contact is on the bottom versus being on the top in the template. So it's another way of doing it absolutely acceptable. What I want to sort of highlight is the fact that, yes, there is use of graphics and color elements. It does not overwhelm. The fonts are simple. Uh, there's uh, the Dunn's number is clearly identified as being a Dunn's number. So if this is read by either a human or a artificial intelligence, intelligence scanning algorithm, it will pick it up and it will know um, what's going on there. Okay, so Teddy, I have a couple of questions. So is the black, yeah. is the black white thing, is that um, particular only to New York and, and your system, what you have to deal with? Uh, what, what was the question is what's particular what, about the color using color versus black and white. Is that a New York thing or just, no, 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 that, uh, the, the, AI. you could use, they recommend as less, uh, color graphics doesn't mean you can't have them. So if you have a logo, yeah, okay. but, but, but not to be overly heavy. So for instance, one of the feedbacks I got, and that's a great question. Ann. Um, and in fact, let me, um, move on towards uh and then the, my other question was yeah tell me about the ein number because i just look because i'm going to show you mine too although i've never used it we'll talk about that um why do you not like the ein tell me that again i don't know. i i don't like it because um it may allow some of some government agencies are trying to create and other incub they're, they're trying to create incubators and one of the ways you sign up with an incubator is using your EIN number. Mm -hmm. And that is again, a tax number. And just for data privacy, I wanna make sure that I am the person linking my, uh, my company, Theo Squared, uh, and not somebody else who happens to possibly have seen my EIN number and they're, mm -hmm. they're going ahead to, or they're applying, let's say for a PPE, a triple P loan, mm -hmm. um, just, just me in terms of data privacy. Not okay. Because, and I also I'm saying this because this, for instance, this uh, capability statement, right? I found it on the web. Mm -hmm. This was not behind a, a, a portal or anything. Okay. It's open to the public. If I submit to a particular agency, yeah, there I add it. In mm -hmm. fact, there I know I have to add it because um, I, from my conversations with contracting officers, they actually look me in the system and they will, and, and they provide feedback and they have provided feedback mm -hmm. to me in terms of, uh, this is what I saw, or you haven't done this and you should really do this mm -hmm. because this will help me out in this way. And I can get into okay. specifics what I mean by that. Also, okay. since you brought this up in New York city, for instance, we do not use NIC codes. We use NIGP codes. Mm -hmm. So ask, before okay. you apply, we're special. Okay. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you you did. And the other thing about cr uh, credit cards that was interesting to me because we don't we don't accept uh, credit cards. I've never accepted credit cards. I've never even asked. I've never even been asked. Um, well, the reason I brought this up, so I actually, um, and this is a great question, right? Because other agencies are now asked to create systems uh, to be more transparent to the way they issue a contract, mm -hmm. but also to minimize the time they spend reviewing proposals uh, needlessly. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a segue to this, because I was on a call St. Patrick's Day in the morning, USAID, for instance, um, 
in, have, having received feedback on their uh, evaluation in general their contracting practices, they now are creating an incubator where instead of submitting a full, a full response to a proposal mm -hmm. with a complete evaluation design, logic model, background of the problem, et cetera, et cetera, they're asking for a brief one page concept note. And then they will tell you if you should, you know, if you should supply a logic model. Mm -hmm. And their vision is by reestablishing this, by the end, the finalists, and they really want to narrow it down to two, three organizations who are going to submit, they have a very good possibility of getting mm -hmm. that contract. And this way they don't waste time on their evaluation side and assessing the proposal and having to convene meetings and then possibly getting in trouble with FOIA and having to disclose everything. So this way it becomes a very transparent, the black box is opened uh, and you know what you're gonna get. Yeah, Makes well, sense? it's also um, less time, it, 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 it would waste less of our time as an evaluation consultant if our concept paper isn't gonna go forward. Cause I don't know about you guys, but I can spend 40 hours on a proposal. Absolutely, I cannot agree more with you, especially, um, you know, in this group, we submitted, for instance, the food corps. That was a very small proposal, as I have now discovered, submitting other ones for larger um, projects or for even smaller projects in do dollar figure, but that are more in, in, in detail for the federal or state government. Okay. Um, so I totally yeah. agree with you, Ann. Yeah. And I got to apologize because my laptop is freezing here. Um, that I've tried making too many things by going to annotate. So I am going to try to stop share for a second. Um, Anybody else have any questions while um, Teddy's doing his thing? I think, yes, totally. I wanna to be the only... Uh, no, I love these questions and, and, and they're great questions. Uh, yeah, I'll, while you're doing that, while everybody's thinking i will tell i mean I, I will show you my capability statement i hadn't um pulled it up it looks like it's since 2019 <laughs> so i had to add my new logo it probably has too much color it definitely has my ein number i've never used it other than my small uh women-owned business um certification that we have to update every year because i think i may have told you guys a long time ago that i had gone through this year where you know uh, a year, several years ago, where I was bound and determined to grow, right? And I thought the way I could do that was by responding to proposals. And we did so many. Uh, and that's, and even then I never used it. So it's really curious to me. Um, I, again, and you might have to stop recording for a few seconds. I apologize. Oh, okay. Hold on just a second. I will add all the grants. So talking to a few folks, and they will tell you what grants have already been funded by previous budgets and what congressional um, guidance. And they'll tell you what is future or what is something that they're starting, but they're going to get the rest of the money in fiscal 21 or 22. And they're upfront about this. My codes are the generic ones for the federal level. If I were to do this for New York City, I would change these codes uh, in New York City. Uh, and I would use the different code system and you would have to ask the agency, hey, what do you guys use, right? Um, and again, on the bottom a little bit where we're based, uh, tech, you know, uh, and stuff like that. So that's the bottom of it. And please share feedback. This is like the fourth version of this, but it is an ongoing uh, conversation. And I appreciate it in particular when people who have seen this provide me feedback. So okay. a lot of the time, yes, have I gotten the contract? No, but they continually provided great feedback as to what I should do. Yeah, so I have a couple of more questions and my apologies because I totally forgot to hit record. I was so into this conversation, so I just started it again. So it sounds like you have a different capability statement depending on what maybe agency or project yeah. you're targeting. Is that correct? Yeah, so for New York City, I kind of decided... I wanted to go with a brownstone version uh, and have elements of a brownstone. Why? Because Brooklyn is associated uh, with brownstones. And then because some things, some community programs are associated with schools, I want to have a graphic that had a red brick because a lot of New York City schools do have that red brick. So it kind of is an ode to that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a different uh 
target audience. And uh, the codes are different. The needs are different. Um, and the bureaucracy is different. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. That was one question. And then the other one is, it sounds like you, you specifically solicited feedback when you developed your capability statements or your, uh, your pamphlet for lack of a better word. Um, is that correct? Or did you just kind of collect it along the way? Did you purposely say, I'm going to ask these handful of people for feedback? No, I did ask a handful of people and, uh, one of the things, and to echo what we've been talking in the IC chat, is to tap into a lot of those resources available through the CARES Act to talk to uh, people in the small business um, administration. And in particular, for our for evaluation, either you're going to get assistance through like a grant or you're going to get an outright contract. In any case, the procurement technical assistance people, PTAC as they're called, they're the ones who see hundreds, if not thousands of these. They're the ones um, who will give you feedback. So uh, reach out to them. That is their job. Um, do it politely and don't expect a response in 24 hours. But this is what they do. They see these. Uh, and I used it in, uh, as an opportunity not only to say, hey, tell me what's wrong with this. And they did. They pointed out. Uh, uh, for instance, one of the things you'll see that I don't have like semicolons or anything after the numbers so that this way it's read, um, uh, it's read easier by them in the, you know, and it's in a column format versus then being one after the other. So it's easier to read. Uh, and these are things that they, they point out, they point out the picture, they'll give you feedback on the font size, etc. Um, but I also use it as, saying, as an opportunity to tell people what evaluation is uh, and to sort of liaison with PTAC and say, you know, we're talking about evidence-based data evidence. Uh, we're talking about using data and policy. Uh, more and more programs will be evaluated. You should know what evaluation is. You should know what AA is. You should ask that the people who do evaluation do it in a culturally responsive manner, right? That is aligned with your goals and what uh, the, uh, the mayor wants and things like that. So it's an opportunity, even if I don't if get something today to sort of cultivate a relationship for the future, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that is my one pager, right? That and this is a generic one, and it's geared to USDA, in particular NIFA, the uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture. Um, and uh, I downloaded at the end again another, just to compare a two pager. So mine's a one pager. This is a two pager, again from an actual organization that's consulting uh, and evaluation work and training. So they, as you can see health management consulting, they do things like that. Um, they list, one of the things they do, they list a little bit of evaluation in terms of what they do in terms of uh, public awareness campaigns. So this is how they do it. Uh, again, it's a two pager where a lot of the information is on the first page. Again, following that same format, they have their contact person, the logo, a background, but a background that does have color, not totally overwhelming some certifications on the bottom, a page where they have the logos of a lot of their clients, a little about testimonial. And again, at the end, they literally list their North American industry classification codes in detail. Um, and they have, you know, you can see that and again, their DUNS number and their cage code. This particular entity did not put their EIN, uh, but you can see that's available by request and et cetera. I do put it in, and I know that my capability statement is going to go through a trusted site, a trusted portal, and I know who the end user is going to be there, right? Um, so that's an, someone else's capability statement. Yep. And uh, that was about it. You know, um, I hope and I wanted to include other folks' capability statements uh, so you can just take a look at that, you know? Awesome. So let me... Um... Just a quick question, Teddy. 
support that last one you showed uh, when they listed their past partners, they use logos. Um, does AI have trouble reading that or is there any best practices versus using logos uh, compared to just listing out the names of your partners? I don't know. That would be a specific one to each agency. Um, don't know, to be honest with you. Uh, and I, do, but obviously the ask for permission before you do it, so to speak. Um, it's not an all encompassing. These are, these change, right? And uh, artistic, uh, it just keep, and it, it's an important because it helps you with your elevator pitch, I think, just knowing what you do and what you don't do. So I will show you guys mine. You'll, Teddy will probably really hate it. But like I said, I don't think I've ever used it. Um, let me see if I can scroll up so you can actually see it. So I just, I just added my new logo. So lots of color on the left. I like yours so much better than mine. So who we are, mission statement, all of that needs to probably get rewritten. Um, so then I have our company information, our core competencies, uh, our differentiation, differentiators, boy, that's a hard word, um, who we serve, certifi our certifications, because we are a woman-owned small business. Um, I do have my EIN number. Now you got me thinking I need to take it out. These are the NACES codes that we chose. But like I said, the only time I've ever used it is for our women-owned business certification. Um, so I'll be really curious um, to, to hear how you guys develop it and how you use it. I think it really depends on the kinds of uh, projects you try to go after is my sense anyway. Yeah, but that's mine and I loaded it on our Google Drive um, uh, just so you guys would have an example and I put a link to the Google Drive. And so that's where all of the recordings are for all of our sessions here. I usually don't record the discussion. Um, so it has the links to any documents I've shared like the business uh, plan or anything like that. 